Hello and welcome to episode 21 of series four of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. Well, after last week's special episode where I recorded my insights from the Unite 23 conference, we're back to our normal schedule. Next episode, which comes up on the 10th of October, I have an interview with Nicole Byrne. Nicole works for the Comms Exchange Limited, and Nicole has just recently left Formula One. She worked in the industry for 25 years, so she has lots of insights and experience about internal communications, employee engagement in a very high-performing environment. What Nicole's going to be showing with us is highly relevant to lots of different sectors and industries so i think you'll find that a fascinating interview and a fascinating insight into a world that many of us are, are not familiar with and then following that on the 24th of october i have an interview with richard nugent richard's been on the show before um, richard has just launched a book called the alignment advantage and what that looks at is the link between strategy culture and customer experience and richard's got some fantastic ideas and thoughts about how we need to align those within our organizations and Richard takes a very much a uh, an engagement and internal commerce perspective on them. So it's highly relevant to, to the work that I'm sure many of you are doing in your organisations um, with regard to strategy and particularly culture change as well. So that's what we've got coming up in future episodes. Remember, if you're not already subscribed to the show, please do so. And remember, you can listen to the podcast now on a variety of different platforms, including YouTube as well. All of our audio goes to YouTube, onto our YouTube channel as well which is the big picture people's uh, youtube channel so hopefully you are enjoying the show and you're finding ways to listen to it and if you could share it with anybody who you know in your network who you think would benefit from it that would be absolutely fantastic as well anyway on to this episode's interview <laughs> We're currently living in a world where our organisations are facing multiple challenges from multiple sources. We've just come out of the pandemic in the last couple of years and we've moved into a world where we're faced with challenges such as cost of living issues across the globe. We're faced with crisis in terms of energy shortages, climate problems and all sorts of other challenges that our organisations are coming across at the moment. And it's not uncommon for us to hear with our clients and across uh, other clients' uh, organisations that we're talking to about a sense of burnout and challenges associated with burnout and all that that entails. People quitting, giving up their long-term careers, big issues with turnover and recruitment and retention in many organisations. So uh, this is a topic I think that resonates with with a lot of organisations. And um, so I wanted to look at what can we do to deal with that sense of organisational burnout? What can we do to help our colleagues to reconnect themselves with their sense of, of, of identity, with the organisation, their vocational calling, and also what it is that they we want to get out of their work a sense of, of joy and thriving in their work rather than feeling as they're just coping and getting by so that's the topic that we're going to be exploring today with our interviewee who works in a healthcare setting albeit that that, that their experience i think translates into a multiple different areas of, and, and is not just unique to healthcare so we're going to be talking about uh, the lear learnings and lessons from 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 our interviewee and how they can apply to a whole range of organizations regardless of which sector they're in and we're going to look at six skills that we can help our leaders to develop to help to develop a sense of thriving and to move beyond that sense of just coping and surviving within our organizations and all of these have strong links to employee engagement and to employee communication so that's what we're covering in today's episode how do we deal with organizational burnout Jennifer Krippner is a recognized expert in the field of patient experience and human-centered care she has over 25 years of experience in strategic planning, patient experience, physician development and employee community engagement. Jennifer is most passionate about building and nurturing connections and relationships. Jennifer is committed to guiding and differ a differentiated human experience that optimizes out outcomes for patients, individualizes services to meet unique needs and assists caregivers in regaining joy and purpose. So hello, Jennifer. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. Good to be with you. Thanks, Craig. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so just to, just for our listeners, whereabouts in the world are you, just so we can position you? You bet. I am in Minnesota, northern Minnesota, actually. And so it's in the central part of the United States, northern, um, just beneath Canada. Yeah. Fantastic. So I introduced you there a little bit about your uh, background. Tell, tell us a little bit about maybe uh, you, your, your career background, Jennifer, and how you've uh, ended up doing what you're doing now and, and what I described in the introduction there. And obviously give us a little bit more and, and maybe some more information about what you're doing now. I've always spent my career in healthcare, typically been inside a health system or a hospital setting, working with the team, the leadership team on how to really help optimize the patient experience. And early on in my career, it was really thinking about how do we have the best experience for the community, for the patients, and what what environment can we create so that when they come into the health system or the hospital or the clinics, is it the best experience for them? And about 15 years ago or so, started to realize that in order to truly have that optimal experience for our patients and families, we need to have our employees and physicians and care teams really working in their optimal environment. So I really shifted my focus to really understand what it's like for the team members and the physicians to be working in an environment that they can feel their best selves. And so have been working um, continuously to create the best experience for for all members um, when they work with a health system or come to experience care at a health system. Okay. Okay. So do you have a, a clinical background or more of a, of a human resources background? What, what, what's your, your own background, uh, Jennifer? Yeah, so I have an administrative background and yeah. really started out really from the marketing side of things and then worked through strategic planning um, and then worked in process improvement and that side of um, the equation. So no clinical background, yeah. but really closely with the clinical teams. Excellent. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so so I guess uh, some of our listeners will be familiar with, with the healthcare system, and, and but I guess the majority will not, as in, you know, the kind of internal aspects of the healthcare system, and, and particularly for people outside of the US. So do you, do you want to just give us a quick overview of what, what are some of the, the core challenges uh, in, in that uh, sector, and, and how, I guess, post-pandemic, there's this kind of shift away from you know, the kind of survival mode that most of healthcare systems were in then into like a, 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 a kind of thriving now, which I know is, is, is the wording that you use. So maybe if you can just give us some of those those challenges, but also just, just talk a little bit about that transformation, please, Jennifer. Yes, thanks for bringing that up. I think um, since the pandemic, we've really been, from a healthcare perspective, thinking about our teams and, and how they navigated those um, few years in really you know, working under pressure and um, through the the conditions that they did. And, Mm. um, you know, I think the whole world suffered. And so how do you move from a point of suffering and surviving and and getting through um, to one where we really want them to be working in a, a state of thriving? And a state of thriving is really working to your best and working in an optimal performance with a team that's really engaged and, and and passionate about what they're doing. And it's hard to be in that state when you're in, in a, in a tired, um, burned out, uh, frame of mind. And so, Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that we need to do to help our teams heal? And what are the things that we need to do to, to, um, face the challenges of our team's, not wanting to work in the profession that they've been in for 20, 30 years. They're leaving. They're, you know, so recruitment and retention are something leaders are really focusing on right now. Mm. And I think that's not just um, unique to healthcare anymore. I think that's a, that's something since the pandemic that all industries are focusing on is that recruitment and retention. Yeah. And so I, you know, I think it's something that we all need to keep a focus on is as leaders, how do we engage uh, our employees and our teams? How do we 
keep them informed? How do we keep them engaged and empowered? And how do we build that trust and build that psychological safety? And so that's what our um, organization at the Institute for Healthcare Excellence is really helping um, the, the clients that we work with is healthcare specific. Yeah. But uh, how, do, how do we help those leaders work with their teams um, to really build that culture of thriving and really help transform their teams? Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about kind of parallel uh, learnings and how this is how some of this can apply across. But I think the point that you made there is is, is absolutely um, accurate, which is this whole case that many organisations at the minute are wrestling with um, people moving away or, or moving into what they perceive to be more attractive fields and maybe moving away from their kind of vocation that, that they've been working on for a number of years, whether that's healthcare, whether that's, you know, kind of logistics, retail or, or, or hospitality. I think that a lot of organizations are facing some of those challenges about how we how we retain people. And I guess healthcare is, I, I, I'm, I'm supposing healthcare has a difference in that a lot of people do you, you know the the gravitate towards it because of the of the you know the kind of sense of doing something good and helping other people and curing other people but i guess that still doesn't mean that it's it's immune from you know those kind of market and uh, uh, or those challenges that, that any other kind of industry faces i guess yes jennifer that you know that is correct i think you know we we go into healthcare because of that calling it is more of a calling and you think about physicians and nurses and and people that spend years and years and years of training to do um, what they feel like they were really called to do. And, um, you know, I think our work really helps them bring back, like, why did you go into healthcare in the first place? Let's, let's go back to that feeling of, of why you, you, you wanted to go into healthcare and help people. Let's let's create that breakthrough for you, and um, have you help reconnect to that purpose. Uh, and uh. typically, the purpose is about relationships. And how did you? Why did you want to have a relationship with your patient? And what did? What was it about that? And then think about how can we get back to that in your day to day interactions with your patients and reconnect to your patients um, in the way that you wanted to in the first place. Okay. So often our days are busy and filled with tasks and checks, checklists and clicks on the computer that it almost strips away the relationship piece of, of our caring for our patients and families. Mm. And so we're really trying to help um, the care team, the physicians and the nurses and, and everyone in, in healthcare to really reinsert those positive emotions, those the time um, um, to build those relationships so that you can go home at the end of the day feeling fulfilled again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and I guess so is that that's the focus of your work and is around that, that that sort of cultural transformation about helping leaders to 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 help people free reconnect them themselves and their their colleagues and the, and the people who work for them back to that original you know purpose and that that sense of of calling as as you've, you've described it. Right. It is. It's it's so important and it is not just the leadership responsibility it's everybody's responsibility but we like start with with the leaders um, because we feel like you know they're responsible for you know setting the stage and and expectations and really building that foundation for the culture for the organization so mm. we really feel like they're um, kind of the positive organizational designers um, and so how can they really lean into and shape, um, their teams to really experience those moments of positive emotions or mm. be able to see that there's efficiency in their time with their patients when they're able to connect in a different way. Um, and so uh, by modeling and role modeling that in, in their interactions with their team members is really important to begin that shift from surviving to thriving. 
Okay, so th- thanks, Jennifer. So, so you you kind of mentioned it already, and we've kind of alluded to it, but um, th- this thing around burnout and and change, uh, a, a lot of organisations are facing the, this at the moment, and 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 I think you know that a lot of clients that I'm speaking to are in in kind of just just even despite the fact that we're out of the the pandemic now or the the immediate aftermath of it is still in a, ca- a case of you, you know particularly given all the other challenges in the world that we have at the moment in terms of cost of living and energy and global uh, climate issues and and, and war <laughs> if that's you know plenty going on there I, I guess there is a case of just let's just get through it and you, you've talked um, ab- about that kind of idea of of getting to a, a position of thriving for, for, for you what, what does that what does that look like and feel like and 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 you've kind of alluded to it already, but I just want to kind of a little put a bit more specific about what we're talking about when we're talking about that that sort of culture of thriving and what that looks and feels like for people in the organisation. Yes, thanks. Thanks for that question because I think so often we go through our day just checking the the our checkbox right of the list of the things that we have to do. We're just going through the motions of. Um, sometimes we even call it depersonalization, right? Like. Um, the woman with diabetes in room six versus Mrs. Jones mm. who has diabetes in room six, right? So um, we're, we may treat that woman, um, Mrs. Jones, differently if we just think of her as a diagnosis versus as, the, you know, a person. And so how do we reconnect to um, the relationship differently? And I think building those relationships um changes our Mm. culture of thriving um, when we're able to connect to people differently. And when we do that, we connect to positive emotions in a different way. Um, Burnout um, at its core is really the absence of being able to connect to positive emotions, Mm. whereas thriving is the ability to cultivate positive emotions frequently. And we like to say connecting to them frequently in small doses throughout your day. So it's not like you have to have this big party of gratitude or experience awe in a in a big way. But if you just connect to them in tiny doses frequently throughout your day, you're going to experience more thriving um, through um, those experiences. And I can just give you maybe a, a, a small example. Mm, please, yeah maybe a leadership perspective. So as you're leading your team, right, you have your typical HR playbook, right? And you can be a successful leader um, by doing the things um, that way. And you can survive and you can lead a team and be successful. But if you truly want a culture of thriving and you want your teams to trust you and you want to have that optimal experience, um, I just ask you, when you think about creating your meeting agenda, does it produce positive emotions? Or when you're going to disseminate or show your dashboard um, with your performance and your, you know, your scorecard of all of your metrics, does that po- does that produce positive emotions? Mm. So what are the skills that you need as a leader to think about a simple meeting agenda or a scorecard that you're going to distribute via email or at, a, at one of your meetings? How can you turn that into an experience of positive emotions? Mm, okay, I like that. That's a good example. Uh, and, and we're going to go on to talk about maybe. I know you, we talked to, uh, uh, um, and when we had the pre-interview about six skills. Just before we move into uh, into that, just just again, just to recap. And, and I know you, you mentioned earlier that, that it's not necessarily just leaders who do this, but I guess there is a uh, leaders do have a disproportionate. Um, impact on this this kind of culture of thriving or or one where we feel as though we're, we're, we're facing burnout uh, 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 i mean what, why is it in your mind that, that leaders sometimes have that disproportionate role i mean is that is that the case do you do you, you, you think they have a, a disproportionate effect on on the on the sort of shape and, uh, and 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 culture within the organization right well i think as as team members and you know in the healthcare world physicians and Nurses really look to the leaders to set the stage. They look to leaders to guide them. And if the leaders are not behaving in the way 
that the teams really want to connect to them. They want a relationship just as well with the people leading the organization. They want the leaders to know what it's like to walk in in the shoes of a frontline staff member or a physician that's you know practicing out in a in a rural setting. Um, they want to feel connected. They want those relationships. And so, if that leader is just surviving or um, not in a relational way, that's going to impact the team as well. So mm-hmm. leaders are um, important role models and really helping to um, navigate and build trust with with the team members. And mm-hmm. so if they're a healthy leader and one that really wants to create a culture of thriving, then their teams um, can see that and feel it and and want the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it's the whole shadow of the leader thing, isn't it? If if the shadow's a a, a positive shadow, then that 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 has a, a, a you know as a, as a trickle down effect. But also the opposite is is the case as well. Right. Yeah. Um. So in the pre call, we talk, you you mentioned there were six skills and and men that are required by leaders to assist this sort of shift away from a kind of a a sense of ju- just coping to towards one that thrives. And you've kind of I don't know whether the one you mentioned there around that 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 um. The, the technique that you mentioned around it, you know, injecting, making sure there's some positive uh, emotion associated with, with, with the conversations. But, but do you want to just elaborate further on those six, six skills, please, Jennifer? Sure. I think um, this is for anybody um, and it's not just, you know, for healthcare. Mm. Um, it's really about connecting um, to one another and building relationships. And when we do that, um, we, we are able to be better people overall. Mm. And um, it's really important um, when you're a physician or a provider or a nurse caring for a patient or when you're a leader wanting to lead a team member or a team of people, it's really important um, that we're present with one another. That is our foundational skill. If we're able to be present, not distracted, um, and we're able to really give that person a moment of our time by looking them in the face, um, taking a deep breath and putting our distractions aside, even if it's for three or four seconds, if it's before we walk in that patient room and take a deep breath in, and then just maybe stating that patient's name in our head, you're able to be present for that person that's in front of you. Mm. If you pair that then with the second skill of listening and really being, um, Presence so that you can listen to what that other person has to say. It can be incredibly powerful and healing. And so by not interrupting that that person um, and really giving them the time and space to um, say what they have to say and and being able to reflect back that you've heard them um, is almost as powerful as loving that person. Mm. And so we have some great studies and um, science and research behind the power of listening in a healing environment. Mm, mm. And so being present and listening, and then really asking those kind of powerful questions, maybe questions that we can't possibly know what the answer is. And they're not yes or no questions as well. So just opening it up and exploring what with that other person, um, what what's on their mind or, you know, why are they there? Um, what do they want to accomplish? Um, and really thinking about um, how can we work together in these next two minutes together? So that's the third, that's the third skill around questioning skills. Yeah. It is. Mm. And then obviously in healthcare, we have some emotions built up right around um, maybe our health or, if we're an employee about our work day or a team member that we're struggling with. So um, once we ask those powerful questions, maybe there's something that's coming up that maybe we need to negotiate around. Like we don't have time in our 10 minute visit today to cover all of these things. How about if we just, um, is it okay if we just talk about one or two of these. So we're going to negotiate like what we're going to discuss today, Hmm. but then there's probably some emotion. So we have to recognize what that emotion is. And so how do we, how do we accomplish like being in tune with, Oh, there's some anger here or there's some frustration or, or there's some joy, right? So recognize what some of those emotions are. 
Um, so that's um, scale four and five, right? Negotiating what we're going to accomplish and then recognizing the emotion and responding in a way um, that's appropriate and that builds trust and respect. And then the final skill is appreciation and really being grateful for the time. If it's two or three minutes that we're together, or if it's 10 minutes that we're together, finding something that you're grateful for, for the mm. time together. Mm. Excellent. No, that's, a, no, that's a really nice. I've written those down as you were talking, just to sort of follow the flow. And it's a nice flow that uh, in terms of, um, so, so how how do you help leaders to develop those skills? Because some of those skills are, you know, kind of things that you can practice and kind of learn in a in a in a conventional way. Others are much more subtle, require, you know, kind of a, an appreciation, a self awareness. Uh, how do you go about actually helping people to develop those in a way that they can mean, you know, use them in a meaningful way, and not just on a kind of theoretical level, Jennifer? Yes. So um, it, you could read a PowerPoint, you could read books, you could do all of those things. But <laughs> our work is really unique in the way that we like to go in and, and help organizations understand kind of what their pain points are and then apply these skills directly to those pain points mm. and help them practice in a, in a safe environment where they can practice with one another with us um, helping facilitate their real life scenarios like mm. here's something that just happened um how might these set of skills apply to that will help practice so that the afternoon they can go back and put the skills to use in their work setting that's applicable to them mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. excellent excellent and um and and roughly how long does would that take to, to 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 you know to be able to train people in that and is there like some ongoing supporting and coaching that people get and mentoring because i guess it's one of those things that you need to reflect on as well and and, and not just go away and think I've, i know it all now how do you how do you deal with that kind of ongoing development so I'm glad you asked that because um, for really this work to be sustainable, we go in and we work with a, a core team at the organization that we're working with. And it's really then peer to peer led and we create an internal team there and they work with um, their internal team and they help facilitate um, work within the organization. So it's like a train the trainer program. and Okay internally led um, throughout the the ongoing years until everybody has the same set of skills. It's really a great foundational um, skill set that all team members, all leaders um, should be working from. And then you can see um, your peers um, speaking kind of a common language and wow. practicing the same skills. And that's really where that culture of transformation happens and that mm. culture of thriving begins to take place and it, it's pretty magical to see happen mm, you get that critical mass i guess where it becomes a norm rather than just an exception yeah correct yeah. and that's when your recruitment and your retention um, metrics and those scorecards as a leader you're able to share um, really are able to experience those positive emotions because you see at about six months or nine months after implementation, really change and, and take place. Um, your quality metrics improve, your um, patient experience metrics improve, your employee engagement, physician engagement metrics improve. And we just recently worked with an, uh, a large um, family birth center in Michigan, and there um, we were specifically looking at their um, retention metrics and mm. um, drastically improved within a year. Mm. You've answered my next question, which was how how do you measure this? That I guess that, that's going to be unique. You know, you've obviously you, you you're speaking you know, quite rightly from a context of what you know and, and what you where you work, which is the obviously the healthcare sector. But I guess it'd be incumbent on you for, for different organisations in different sectors to recognise what metrics KPIs are linked to. Uh, you know the cultural or culture of thriving or surviving or, or, or burnout, and and start to sort of relate those across to say whether an intervention like this would be you know making an impact, which uh, which it sounds like it is from your perspective. Yeah. Yes, we work with each organization to develop the pre and and post and ongoing metrics that they would like to follow. We out 
also recommend yeah. from what we see across the country on different metrics. Um, grievances is another. We have our own um, burnout, thriving, and recovery metric that we um, disseminate um, pre and post that, that we follow. And so it's um, a really good tool to help them measure. And so it's it's wonderful to see the metrics change. What's really wonderful to see are the hearts and minds change of the people that we work with. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Excellent. So Jennifer, just, just wrapping things up then in terms of, uh, you, you know, we've got a very... Um, very broad and diverse audience, and as I said, you know, you've, 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 you've I thank you for for kind of recognizing that that the, what you know the applicability of what you you you've, your your expertise is in the and the, and the, obviously the you you you're very um, knowledgeable in the healthcare sector, but recognizing that this is applicable outside I, I, for people who are just listening into this and you know recognizing that they maybe do have challenges with burnout and 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 you know and obviously consequent retention and turnover issues just just any other you've given you've given been very generous in what you've shared any any other kind of final tips in terms of you know where where would we start with with this sort of thing in our organization if if we you know if we recognize some of the phenomena you've talked about and we just want to kind of get started what what, what would you would, would you recommend there for, for for anyone who's listening and recognizes that challenge i think you know outside of healthcare i think one thing that um, leaders or, or any team members can do is just start to pay attention and listen to your team members. Mm. Um, walk around, um, start to recognize your team members and, and individuals as humans and as people, and start to ask those open-ended questions that maybe you haven't in the past. If there's a picture on their desk or um, you've noticed something different, just pause, be present for a moment, ask an open-ended question and start to make connections. And it's amazing how that helps build trust. And when you start to build trust within a team, it's amazing how more engaged team members will be. And when Mm. you get engaged team members, you're going to start to transform your culture into one of a thriving team. Mm. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you. So, Look, Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, just in case any, and I'm, I'm not saying in case, I'm, I'm sure people will want to follow up on your work. What I'm going to do in, in putting the um, in the links is your LinkedIn profile, if that's okay, and also a link to Healthcare Excellence. Is that okay if I put those links into the show notes, yeah? It would be wonderful, and I'd be happy to, to talk with anybody in any industry or health sector, any um, sector that would be interested in, in chatting. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate your time. That's been uh, a topic that I wanted to cover for a while now, and, uh, and and it was you who proactively reached out to me to to offer offer your offer your 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 services and your uh, your your wisdom. So I appreciate that very much. Um, and uh, th- thank you so much. And uh, maybe we get you back on the show at some point in the future because I think this is a topic that isn't going to go away soon. And and I think you've got some really interesting perspectives on it. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. If you've got any ideas for episodes you'd like us to cover in future, you can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can use the feedback form at engagingic.com. If you're not already subscribed to the show via your podcast platform, please do so. And if you could leave a review for us, that would be absolutely fantastic. We have links to other episodes at engagingic.com. All of our previous episodes are available there. And if you're interested in our visual communication services, our big pictures, our learning maps, our explainer videos, and also our live graphic recording, please get in touch with us again at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk. Thank you.